Hello and welcome to a new episode of Germany in Focus, a news podcast made possible by members of The Local. Today, we're going to talk about the Christmas markets opening this week across the country. We're getting into the budget crisis story that keeps getting bigger. The German government is set to legalize cannabis and it's relaxing the rules even more than planned. So we'll fill you in on that. With winter well and truly here, we'll get into some of the practical things you should know about preparing for it in Germany, whether driving or cycling. We'll hear from our reporter in Stuttgart about the ongoing problems at the immigration office there. And finally, we'll talk about some events that are not Christmas markets happening this December to give you some inspiration to get out and about in the cold. I'm Rachel Loxon and I'm in Berlin today with journalists Aaron Burnett and Imogen Goodman. Hello. 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 How are you both? Yeah, I'm very, very excited about the snow. But I have to say, if you do hear a slight sort of scratch in my voice at the moment, I have succumbed to a bit of a winter lurgy. It's nothing too bad. And I am treating myself the German way with Ekeltong's tea. So some oh, herbal tea, tea. So I'll be fine. If you take no your German time. citizenship test in winter, that's on it. You know? Wow. Yeah. yeah. The Ekeltong's can you, tea. Can you name all the teas? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, I feel like you, Imogen, and almost everyone in Germany is ill right now. So I, yeah. I think we're, we're doing good to be here, guys. Yeah, we, yeah, are. we are. That's be, commitment. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you well, Aaron? Yes, definitely. Having recovered with some El Keltung's tea recently myself and winding up for a great holiday season, which I'm December is a favorite month of mine. Uh, it contains Christmas, my birthday, my boyfriend's birthday, my brother's birthday. So it's it's busy. Exciting. Okay, well, let's start today on a cheery note. It's December 1st when this episode comes out. It's definitely Christmas market time and the first Advent is coming up too. So Aaron, we know that you live for Christmas. Yeah. Tell us about some of the Christmas markets that have been opening this week. Well, uh, let's start with my personal favorites. Um, and that is the Christmas market at Schloss Charlottenburg in Berlin. Uh, it's finally open as of this week. And so is uh, the huge market at Berlin City Hall, another one of my big favorites. What I like about these two is how many small businesses there still are there selling everything from Kalter Hund, which is a great chocolate treat to have at this time of year, to gloves, crafts, hand-carved woodwork, the works really. And as much as I love a good glue vine, you two know that a proper Christmas market should also, I think, be a great place to actually buy fabulous things um, from local businesses, whether it is food for the season, gifts or decorations. And these markets certainly have those, which is why they make it right to the top of my list. A few other favorites from around Germany. So getting out of Berlin for a second, Dresden. The uh, Stieselmarkt, fabulous, fabulous market. I've been there myself. And Nuremberg's absolutely massive, huge Christmas market that extends its way over streets and squares and uh, all over the place. Uh, and that one actually has a big opening ceremony on December 1st, the day that this episode comes out. So check that out if you're in the area. Both of these are absolutely magical. I can tell you that from experience. Yeah, we've got to get to Nuremberg. That sounds amazing. Aaron, can you share a little of the history on Christmas markets? Because they're copied all over the world now, right? Well, let's talk about <laughs> those copycats, if you will, for a moment. Um, I have seen a few uh, Christmas markets outside of German-speaking countries, including in London when I lived there, to use one example. And all I'm going to say is that there is a long way to go outside of German-speaking countries to catch up to how we do Christmas markets. Sorry, I'm, I have a bit of a superiority complex there. <laughs> the original is still the best. Christmas markets started in the Holy Roman Empire, which is, of course, now Germany, in the late 1200s. So we're at 800, 800 years of history there. Uh, and they began as a way for people to stock up on supplies, mainly meat originally for the upcoming winter, which we're talking about. I mean, they stocked up on meat. We now stock up on a Keltung's tea. <laughs> <laughs> and glue vine. You know, yes. Uh, you know, very, they had very practical origins. Um, but by the 1400s, they were jazzing um, them up a bit with selling children's toys, roasted nuts, sweets, those sorts of things, getting a little bit closer to the, to the glue vine that we have today. 
And uh, Dresden is also uh, the oldest that is still running. So that is definitely right. worth checking out if you really want some of that uh, historical flair. Of course, there are a few medieval style ones. I don't know how traditional they are, but um, also worth checking out if you want to step back, back in time a little bit. Definitely. I feel like the theme of this podcast is Dresden this week. <laughs> it seems to be, yes. Yeah, we're we're going mentions. east. We yeah. ignore Saxony a little bit. Exactly. Let's let's make up for that exactly. today. Exactly. There's more to come on Dresden. Stay tuned. Uh, Imogen, the first Advent is on Sunday. Can you remind us again of this German tradition and like how can people take part in it? Yes, absolutely. So if you're a little bit like Aaron and like to kick things off as early as possible, you'll be pleased to know that you can legitimately start celebrating this week uh, because the start of Advent basically marks the start of the run up to the Christmas season and to Christmas itself. So Advent actually stems from the Latin word for arrival. So this four week period is all about preparing for the arrival of Christ. Uh, for many people, though it's more about just getting into the festive spirit and getting excited for Christmas. If you do notice that a lot of Christmas markets open up on or around uh, November 27th, that's because this is the earliest date that Advent can start, as it's always the fourth Sunday before Christmas. So what traditions are there? Well, there are three you may know of. So the Advent calendar is a very obvious one and maybe the best known one. Uh, this is, uh, as it as the name suggests a calendar often with little chocolates treats and you open a window each day uh, with the biggest and best chocolatey treat coming on the 24th. Uh, the second tradition which maybe fewer people will have heard of is the Advent's Krantz or Advent wreath. So this is a wreath made out of first sprigs and four candles which are usually red. Uh, these candles symbolise the four Sundays leading up uh, to Christmas and you're meant to light them week by week though many people just skip ahead and light them all at once because it looks a bit weird just having one or two lit <laughs> and we do need light at this time of year I think. So finally um, my personal favourite is Advent's Backen which are delicious cookies and cakes that are baked this time of year. So this can be anything from kind of little biscuits in Christmassy shapes maybe Christmas trees or stars which are usually flavoured with kind of seasonal spices but the king of all the Advent's Backen has to be the Christstoll or Stollen, which is the extremely yummy Marzi pancake that originated in Dresden. Absolutely love it. Guys, by the way, I already have an advent calendar and I put my Christmas tree up on, like oh, earlier wonderful. in the week. <laughs> okay, you're trying to outdo Aaron this year. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, my tiny Christmas tree is so cute. Well, I, I have seen that tiny Christmas tree and I'm afraid that <laughs> the one that I will be buying is a lot larger. <laughs> it's true. My, I did show, I showed them a picture of it, but it's it's still so cute. Even It is very small, cute. Small but perfectly but, formed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. So guys, what are your tips for doing a Weihnachts marked right in Germany? So I've got a couple of tips. Um, my main one would be just trying to beat the crowds if you can. Now, this is not very easy to do. Obviously, Christmas markets are hugely popular. But I would say to take advantage of it getting dark a bit earlier and going for that sweet spot around four or five. When it's getting dark, you've got that romantic atmosphere, but uh, you don't quite have the crowds that might come sort of after working hours and later in the evening. I'd also say be a little bit strategic about the amount of glue vine you have maybe before you're shopping to avoid the uh, very tipsy maybe impulse buy purchases maybe that's part of the fun though Ah, uh, yes, because I would disagree <laughs> with that strategy. Um, I would actually advise you order a glue vine about every half an hour, about every 30 minutes, not 35, 30, uh, and walk through the market. It is obviously there to relax you, but also to warm your body on the inside while you shop. That is why it is there. It's, its warming effect does, in my experience, seem to wear off after about 30 minutes, which is why I'm giving this particular <laughs> number to use. So time it right uh, and go to a Christmas market where you can buy more than just food or glue vine, as the case may be. There's great local businesses selling things that can be difficult for you to find elsewhere. Um, Christmas markets in actually, I will say, are an underrated place to find handcrafted jewelry, for example, or, mm -hmm. you know, decorative wood carvings and 
yeah. all of those kinds of things. So do go to one where you can actually shop properly. Really nice. And I would add there, drink responsibly, but also <laughs> carry cash on you because yeah. Oh, yeah. most of these or a lot of these places will, will not accept the card, especially in Germany. And also check out in case there are is any entertainment on, because sometimes at a certain time there's a lovely choir or something like that. And it's really beautiful. Yeah, that's a good one. And your fund, remember, your Christmas mugs, they have a fund or a deposit. Yep. Um, and so you get some money back. But sometimes they're so nice that you just like to take them home. Okay, let's move on to the biggest story in Germany at the moment, the debt crisis. Now, we did talk a lot on the debt break last week, but this story just keeps snowballing. So we're going to try and explain the latest on what's going on. Imogen, you've been writing a lot about the debt break. We'll make sure to include your article in the show notes and any updates. Can you share the latest developments? Yes. So as we covered last week, uh, this all dates back to this bombshell decision by the Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe that basically found um, a 60 billion euro fund pot of money for climate transformation that the government had kind of set aside to be unconstitutional. There is a kind of complicated history behind this, but ultimately it relates to the debt break, uh, which is a cap on borrowing that is basically enshrined in the German constitution. So as I say, there is this yearly cap on borrowing, but this can be set aside during periods of national emergency. And in this case, the money that we're talking about was borrowed or earmarked for borrowing during the COVID crisis. It didn't get used for that. Um, so the government decided to repurpose this for their climate transformation goals. But ultimately, what was decided is that repurposing money in this way wasn't allowed. Basically, if you borrow money, extra money during a state of national emergency, it can only go towards that specific emergency and not for other purposes. Mm -hmm. So that means that not only the 60 billion climate transformation fund is, is affected, but also also a 200 billion euro pot that was set aside for things like energy price relief, the energy price break in the aftermath of the Ukraine war. So both of these massive pots of money were basically erased from the government budget overnight. So what's been going on recently? Well, the government has been facing two major questions on this. How do they plug their financial black hole in 2023? And how do they work the budget in 2024 to deal with the lack of this money, which they had planned for and thought they would have? Well, the first question has been solved now, basically after a lot of internal debate. Finance Minister Christian Lindner of the Free Democrats has said he's going to produce a supplementary budget. So this is basically an amendment to the budget that was already approved earlier this year. And what this does is it earmarks 43 billion euros of spending on things like the energy price breaks and also funds for rebuilding regions in Western Germany that were hit by the floods back in July 2021. And it basically legitimises those. So the plan is then to argue that this extra borrowing should be permitted this year outside of the debt break because the country is facing the dual emergency of the high energy prices caused by the Ukraine war and also the continued impact of the floods, so this natural disaster. So in other words, the government is yet again making use of this special emergency clause that allows them to ignore the debt break but there is still an open question about 2024. So they are agreeing this supplementary budget, as you've said, Imogen. What's been the reaction to all of this? Well, one major criticism that we've heard from several quarters over the past few weeks is that during this huge crisis, Chancellor Olaf Scholz has basically been missing in action. So for around two weeks after this court judgment, we didn't hear anything from him. Uh, but he actually addressed the Bundestag earlier this week. And 
basically gave an update on the situation. I think anyone hoping for direct clarity or, or sort of new answers to what will happen next year would have walked away disappointed. But what he did say is that the spending that the government had done over the past few years, this additional spending, that was justifiable because the government has basically faced emergency after emergency. He also said that, you know, these modernization projects, you know, mo making a green economy in Germany, that was non-negotiable. And he also repeated his characteristic phrase, you'll never walk alone. So really trying to give people a sense of reassurance there. As I said, can you really reassure people when you're not giving a, a plan of action? I don't know. But there were some hints that he might want to suspend the debt break for yet another year in 2024. As you might expect, the harshest criticism and backlash to all of this has been from the opposition CDU, who brought the initial complaint about the debt break to the Constitutional Court. Friedrich Merz, the leader of the CDU, absolutely ripped into Schultz at his parliamentary address this week. So he compared him to previous SPD chancellors like Billy Brandt and Gerhard Schröder and basically said that Schultz was unfit for the job. He said he was wearing shoes at least two sizes too big for him. There has been some speculation about the government maybe working together on this with the CDU, with opposition parties, just to try and get away out of this crisis. But Merz made it pretty clear that the CDU and CSU are determined to be a thorn in the government's side. So they've even threatened to take the government to court again if they try and suspend the debt break for another year. And they've also said that any reform of the debt break mechanism is off the cards. So perhaps a clause that would allow uh, the government to borrow for investment, but not for day to day spending. They've ruled that out as well. So really giving uh, the traffic light coalition very few options. That is really interesting, isn't it? I think you mentioned Imogen, but it was the, the Conservatives who complained to the Constitutional Court in the first place. And basically, they've just thrown a complete spanner <laughs> in the works of everything. And they're just so against any kind of debt, aren't they? Absolutely. I mean, I think I think this is quite something to not even allow borrowing for investment, which has kind of become, a, you know, a mainstay of kind of economic principles. That is something that pays off in the longer term. It really does feel like they've chucked some dynamite into the workings of the government and then just kind of run away and said, it's nothing to do with us. Try and work that out. But we, we're going to give you guardrails that make you make it impossible to move, really. <laughs> Effective, politically, a good move from the opposition, Definitely. though. <laughs> well, also because uh, this particular debt break, it's constitutional, as, as Imogen said, that would mean that, you know, getting rid of it would require a two thirds majority of the of, of the Bundestag to actually be able to amend the constitution to get rid of it. So it is sort of a, a particular tool that the opposition can use um, wherein it doesn't have a simple majority uh, in the Bundestag to push through legislation that it wants. Of course, you can, uh, any government can just spend the debt break for a year with a simple majority, but to get rid of it, they would they would need obviously more than that. So it's a, it's, it's quite a tool. At the same time, it's, um, it's a political tool as well. I mean, 61% of Germans in one poll actually support having the debt break, for example. So it, it does remain popular despite all of the political chaos it's causing and all of the headlines that are going through German newspapers right now. Mm -hmm, so many. Is the coalition government in trouble, Imogen? Yeah, well, I think we have hinted at it, but this really is yet another existential crisis for the traffic light coalition. There's even speculation that this could be the end. This could be the breakup of this coalition of the Social Democrats, the Greens and the FDP. Basically, I think the main issue is this goes right to the heart of some of their main disagreements. So for the FDP, there have been some real red lines um, when it comes to the kind of fiscal responsibility and conservatism. So raising taxes is a no-no, getting rid of the debt break is a no-no. So that really leaves the Greens and the SPD with not very many options. Their preferred option would be let's suspend the debt break again, let's try and reform the debt break, and let's perhaps, if we have to, uh, to avoid borrowing more, introduce something like a wealth tax, which Germany doesn't have and which could raise billions. So with the FDP kind of putting the brakes on this, it seems like another period of deadlock. That said, 
This isn't new. Crises are not new for the Traffic Light Coalition. They have dealt with crisis after crisis after crisis. And if the alternative to finding a solution is a messy breakup, maybe new coalition talks, possibly another election, handing power over to the CDU, then I think they'll probably want to try and put some uh, compromises on the table and try and find a way out of this. Yeah. They always seem to find a way through things. It's Yeah, it's with 11th hour. <laughs> and one big piece of news that's an offshoot of the budget fallout and that will affect people in Germany is that the energy price caps are ending earlier than planned. Imogen, what will that mean for people listening? Uh, the short answer is not that much right now. Um, as you might remember, the uh, gas price break states that anything over 12 cents per kilowatt hour uh, will be compensated for by the government and anything above 40 cents uh, per kilowatt hour for electricity will be compensated. Now, gas and electricity prices have fallen a lot this year. So really, people aren't getting much relief, if any, at all from the government right now. So this will end in December. The idea of extending it was really to give people that extra bit of security because we don't know what will happen next year. But as I said, the short answer answer is, if the energy market stays as it is, um, it won't have too much impact in the medium term. Um, it just depends on what happens with those prices and maybe what you're paying right now. Thank you so much for that, Imogen. Before we carry on with our chat, I'd like to ask that you consider supporting our podcast by becoming a member of The Local. We are an independent media outlet and your support is what allows us to produce all the news and all of the cultural and practical explainer articles that we write. And it allows us to do this podcast. So if you would like to join, you can find a link to a special offer for podcast listeners in the show notes, or you can access it directly at thelocal.de slash podcast offer. And please hit follow, leave a review and a rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. Germany is legalizing recreational use of cannabis, but there have been a few developments on this topic recently. The first is that it's been delayed. The first phase of the law is not going to come into force on January the 1st now. And the second thing is that the rules are actually going to be more relaxed than first thought. At least that's the government's plans. Aaron, let's start with the delay. What's going on there? Well, this law was supposed to see a parliamentary vote in mid-December. So, you know, two weeks from now. That's been postponed because the government parties in parliament have been negotiating some changes to the law, uh, which took a little longer than originally planned, really. What has changed about the latest draft of the law agreed by the government? Well, the new draft is actually less strict than the previous one. Uh, So before, you weren't going to be allowed to smoke up anywhere uh, within 200 meters of a school or a similar facility. That will be reduced to 100 meters. You'll also be able to be in possession of 50 grams at a time rather than 25 like before. But you won't be prosecuted unless you have more than 60 grams in a private area or 30 in a public one. And maximum fines are going down too to 30,000 euros from an initial 100,000 euro proposed fine. So this law will be a lot more relaxed than the previously planned one. What's the reaction to this both from within the government and outside it? Well, parliamentarians from government parties say this represents a big paradigm shift, that prohibition of cannabis is the thing that's harmful and not cannabis itself. uh, And that's such a prohibition a harmful prohibition is ending. The opposition Christian Democrats are particularly critical, though, of the relaxations on how many grams a person can have in their possession and the reduced required distance away from schools, for example. They say that this will probably bring up uh, issues of child protection and it will be harder ultimately to keep cannabis away from minors. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Aaron. We'll keep an eye on that story and post any updates on it on the website. With winter weather sweeping into Germany this week, it's a good time to think about how to prepare yourself practically for all that snow, ice, wind, horrible low temperatures, especially if you're driving or cycling. So Aaron, let's start with you. We know you're a driver, (laughs) firstly, a driver in Germany. What should people know about driving here? Are there any specific rules about changing tires, for example? 
Well, where I come from in Canada, of course, uh, we have sort of time-dependent uh, rules on when you're supposed to have winter tires and not, mm-hmm. uh, for example. That doesn't exist here the same way. There, the rules in Germany are condition-dependent. Uh, so that simply stipulates that you need to have winter tires on if you're driving during winter conditions. So if there's a snowstorm. If you don't, you risk a 60 euro fine. But uh, if you happen to um, have summer tires on, for example, on a dry day in December, that is totally fine, unlike some other jurisdictions. Uh, most people in Germany, though, uh, follow an October to Easter rule where they just have winter tires on anyhow, just in case, obviously, because mm-hmm. it, it's the weather. It's by nature unpredictable. That's probably a safer bet uh, just for the peace of mind. Also, keep in mind that if you're planning a little winter holiday this year, for example, hello, Bavarian listeners, just because Germany has condition-dependent rules rather than time-dependent ones doesn't mean that certain neighboring countries have those same rules. So Austria, for example, you need to have winter tires on from November 1st to April 15th by law. So especially uh, for our listeners out there in the south of the country who might fancy a cross-border ski jaunt this winter, just put those winter tires on. Also, driving on the Autobahn. If you're doing that in winter, keep in mind uh, that you might have wet weather limits. So basically, there's a speed limit in place that might uh, either be in place, um, period, if you're on a stretch of the Autobahn that doesn't normally have a limit, or uh, there might, if you are on a stretch of the Autobahn that has a fair weather limit, there might be a wet weather limit, which is lower than it normally would be. So just have a look at that number, and it will usually say by NASA. So in wet weather. Good to know. Imogen, I know you cycle a lot, including in the winter months. How can you get through winter in Germany on your bike? Yeah, uh, most people probably are not quite as crazy as I am, but cycling in winter is definitely doable. Uh, You just have to watch out for a few things, darkness and cold. So I'd say one thing that happens if you're cycling is that your extremities, so your your head, your feet, your hands are the things that get really, really cold. So make sure you invest in the thickest and best gloves possible and something to protect your head and ears as well, Uh, potentially ear flaps under a helmet that can be a really, really a good idea to prevent that brain freeze you can get with those icy winds. If it is snowy, uh, it's best not to cycle when it's actually snowing. Wait for those cycle paths to be gritted or cycle extremely carefully. But I'd say if in doubt, absolutely avoid that. Another thing, bike lights, you probably do have these already, but make sure they're very, very good. Possibly invest in high-vis gear, because even if you're cycling to work or wherever you're going in the light, it's almost guaranteed to be dark by the time you cycle back. Again, for safety, I think you might also want to check with your local bike shop uh, to get a bit of advice on your tyres, which ones are best if your tyres are kind of suitable for winter cycling. And also avoid main streets or streets with a lot of traffic because these tend to be the streets that get icier. So if you can take a back route, uh, that can be really advisable in those winter months when things can just be a little bit slippier than they normally are. Really good advice. Thank you both for that. One big part of living in Germany as a non-EU national is going to the Ausländerbehörde or immigration office. And we often hear horror stories about people's experiences there all over the country. We have covered a lot of this in previous episodes of the podcast, but in Stuttgart, the problems have reached boiling point in recent months. This week, I spoke to Mike Stutchbury, who's based in Stuttgart and has been interviewing and writing about some of the people affected for the local Germany. We'll add the stories in the show notes. I asked Mike to explain what's been going on. Well, essentially what we've got happening in Stuttgart is a, I would say... (laughs) I wanted to say slow, but it's it's, it's slowly gathering pace. It's, it's like rolling down here like a snowball. A degradation in the ability of the, the migration authority, the, the Aslanderbehörde, to deal mm-hmm. with the number of, well, simply the day-to-day operation of the, of the, of the authority. And uh, this really started in the middle of the year. We gained immediate attention in the middle of the year because you started to see large, long queues overnight in many cases outside the building on Eberhardstrasse in the city centre where... People need to go to to renew visas and, and and other things, and yeah, it was it was a huge embarrassment for the city. So essentially, what we had was national TV crews coming down, 
talking to people, finding out their stories, and and it was discovered that it, it's taking months, in some cases years, for fairly simple things to be dealt with by this this authority. And that sort of culminated in October when the city uh, was finally forced to act and grant emergency appointments. But as we've found that these emergency appointments are only for one particular aspect of the, of the process of for people who have a work permit or a blue card that's uh, about to, to expire and they need to renew it. But there's so many other things that the people in Stuttgart who have to deal with the Auslander per heard still experiencing problems with. And in fact, I was contacted by a number of people from the community who had sort of basically come together and uh, created a, a huge file of their stories that talks about ongoing problems and the consequences that it's having for them. What is the effect on these people that you've spoken to, Mike? What have you found people have been struggling with? Well, it's uh, for a number of people. There's, there's, you know, they're un- unable to leave the country. Okay, that's that's fair enough. But for um, other people, for example, there are those who are students who are some of the Stuttgart's universities who have been offered a job, who have a, who essentially have a contract, but are unable to take up that contract because they need the the, the conditions on their visa to be changed. And mm. that's requiring an in-person appointment. Other people, I did mention before the fact that some people need to leave the country, some of them for medical emergencies. And there was more than one person that uh, that I spoke to who had parents who were, had a medical emergency in India and they were unable to leave because they didn't know that they'd be able to get back into the country. Because if there's one thing that the German border officials could be fairly stringent on, it's that you have all the proper documentation to enter the country. So even talked to to one young woman, Ankita, who uh, is getting married in, in January, but that wedding date is now being threatened because she hasn't got the, the renewal of, of, the, of the blue card that she's going to need to essentially <laughs> get back into the country after at the end of it. So it's um, it's causing real problems. And and in my discussions with people, it's not just the fact that they can't leave the country or they can't be involved in a or help in a family crisis. It's things like the not knowing when they're when you know, for example, a family reunion visa is going to be granted or a change in permit that's going to allow them to work. It, it's causing very real health problems. Um, you know, there are a few people that I spoke to who are you know receiving medical treatment for blood pressure, and, and in fact, there was one person I, I wrote about it in the story that I wrote for the local who didn't want to be named, but she's she's married to a German, and, and the, the fact that it's taken over a year for her to get her permanent residency is is causing friction in her marriage, and she sort of said that she feels unwelcome in the country, and it's it's really causing stress. It's causing a lot of problems for a community in what is a very international city. Stuttgart is home to Bosch, Daimler, Porsche, and it requires a huge workforce of skilled workers. And uh, many of those skilled workers are, are, are feeling like that this is not the place that is, is where they want to be, where they want to contribute. And this is kind of compounded by the fact that surrounding Stuttgart, there are smaller Kreis or counties such as Ludwigsburg, Berblingen and Göppingen. And they also have a, a rather large sort of industrial base, uh, lots of companies there. And people are going and they're moving to these areas and their cases are being dealt with in a matter of weeks rather than months. That's one thing that kept on coming up. Do you know how it got so bad or why it got so bad? And what are immigration authorities saying about all of this? Well, the, the Stuttgart city has not been entirely sort of really forthcoming with what's been causing these issues. I mean, staffing has been a common theme. I mean, SWR, the regional broadcaster, investigated and found that I think there were 41 positions within the Auslander Behörde that had not been filled. The city government has said they have brought in people to from other departments to, to fill in. Other people have posited that it's digitisation since since the work that's being conducted is has to be carried out with big paper files, some of sort of said the structure of the building, sort of hinting that, you know, that there are problems getting the paper, the files around the building. But no, the, the, the city government has been rather silent on the matter, apart from saying, look, we've got these emergency appointments. If you've got a, uh, a visa that's, that's expiring in the next seven days, enter your details on this website and we'll get back to you. But as I said before, that really doesn't sort of deal with the backlog of all the other things that an Auslander or a migra- migration authority has to deal with. Yeah. So they've offered these emergency appointments, as you said, that will help some people, but a lot of people will still not get help. 
what what kind of happens from here, Mike? Have, are there any other plans to reorganize the authority or do people just kind of have to bait it? I actually asked, I said, is, are there any forthcoming plans to expand these appointments? When I asked, they said, no, simply, we these are the appointments, this is the website that you need to go to. We understand that it can be frustrating. The spokesman that, that, uh, that they wanted me to quote sort of said, you know, please don't, <laughs> if you've already got something in the system, don't reapply. We are aware of it. Um, but again, this this really doesn't sort of address systemic issues. And um, it's it's getting to the point where some rather large companies in the area are starting to say, look, this isn't good enough. We can't attract and retain talent if this is this is a problem. In fact, a, a larger technology company called Trump actually offered to help the government to offer services in in expediating cases, but uh, <laughs> the city government knocked them back and it's, it's it's a really complex situation, and um, we, we hear a lot from you know I'm, I'm cons- consistently receiving stories from people who have uh, read the stories in the local about the Stuttgart uh, immigration office, and they're saying you know I don't know what to do either. Should I leave or should I, I? I don't have the money to leave. What's going to happen? In fact, one sort of thing that comes up a lot in the chats and the emails that I receive is is you know am I going to be deported, which is a is a very serious matter, and and the. The, the, the idea that, you know, these people who are qualified, who have been attracted to Stuttgart by these huge companies uh, are really sort of considering the fact that they may be deported. It's, 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 it's shocking. It's a real indictment on the city. Before we finish today, let's talk about some lovely events coming up in December, not including the Christmas markets. Have you got your eyes on anything else coming up across Germany, Imogen? Well, it's a Dresden again for me. I'm particularly <laughs> looking forward to the Dresden Stollen Festival or Stollenfest, uh, which celebrates this delightful and well-known Christmas treat. Uh, so that's on the 9th of December, which mm-hmm. is a Saturday. What I love about this is that every year they bake a massive Stollen in Schlossplatz, the central square. And by massive, I mean massive. Uh, it can sometimes weigh around two tons. Oh my <laughs> <laughs> this is, it's going, it's worth the trade. I don't care if you live in the West, get yourself to, uh, to, <laughs> to see the two ton stolen. <laughs> the biggest stolen in the world. We did think that Imogen was making this up to start with. <laughs> But it sounds no, amazing. I do my research. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't lie about something as serious as this. The True. biggest Stollen. Um, of course, it also wouldn't be a traditional German Volksfest without nominating a queen of some kind. And in this case, it's the Stollen Mädchen or Stollen Girl, oh. who is apparently defined by her love of baking and her passion uh, for keeping this traditional craft alive. So the Stollen Mädchen actually plays quite an important role at the start of the Stollenfest because she is the one who gives the sh- signal for the bakers to start baking their massive Stollen <laughs> on the day. <laughs> so this is, uh, without the Stollen Mädchen, the massive Stollen would never exist. They so are... She there just- is- she just gets them to start and then she leaves because the- I, and she comes back. She's like, I'll come back when it's ready, boys. And then she uh, she eats it all herself. Two tons later. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll yeah. see you right through winter. Absolutely. I know. Well, that, I, that may be where the tradition comes from. This feeds the entirety of Dresden for the winter months. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That is amazing. Aaron, what are you looking forward to? Well, I, like many of us, have experienced the war zone that is New Year's Eve in Berlin uh, with all of the excitement of watching and the uh, dread of having to dodge uh, fireworks and other sort of stray projectiles and to protect your eardrums um, with them exploding right next to you and all of those kinds of things. It is a a once-in-a-lifetime thing hopefully. Hamburg's Philharmonic, on the other hand, is putting on, uh, you know, quite a different kind of New Year's Eve event. They are putting on a concert for those who are looking for a way to get away from those fireworks and falling projectiles and dangerous explosive things. They have some music by Mozart and other composers on the night. It just sounds lovely. Really nice. So I'm also feeling like I need a good chunk of culture. One thing I'm looking forward to in Berlin is the festival Orchestra Berlin's Four Seasons by Vivaldi, which is on December 22nd and then again in January, I believe. And it would also be nice to get out of Berlin and go to 
Dresden. You want course. some two ton <laughs> stolen there? To, yeah, to get the st- to get the stolen. We do not work for the Dresden Tourist Board. I just need to say this now. <laughs> it's a don't. great city. <laughs> we don't, but we love it's it. It's a great place to visit. We so love it. I would go to Dresden. I would obviously get the two ton stolen, <laughs> but also not all of it. <laughs> not all of it, just a slice. It might be hard to put that under your tiny Christmas tree. <laughs> My God, yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, they have a Swan Lake performance by the Prague Festival ballet Ooh. on December 28th which just sounds gorgeous yeah that yes. does sound gorgeous you can enjoy some two ton stolen and then go see some <laughs> ballet perfect sounds like a great night out okay that's it for this week thank you to all our listeners as always we will add links in the show notes for the stories we've been talking about this week's panelists have been Imogen Goodman and Aaron Burnett our guest was Mike Stutchbury and our sound engineer is Reese Edwards I'm Rachel Loxton. We hope you enjoyed listening and we'll be back again next week. Until then, take care. <laughs>